Hi, everybody. This is Rob Swatsky from the York Campus of Hack. And in this podcast, we'll be continuing on with Chapter 10 with our focus on muscle contraction. The sliding filament mechanism is the current scientific model that describes how skeletal muscle shortens when contracted. It was once thought that muscle fibers folded up during contraction, but we now know that instead, the thin filaments slide past the thick filaments. When muscles contract, the myosin heads at both ends of the thick filaments attach to and pull the thin filaments toward the M line as they slide toward the middle of the sarcomere. From a side view, the myosin heads are angled in a way that resemble the tail feathers of an arrow. Both the I band, shown in blue, and the H zone, shown in green, become more narrow as the thin filaments are sliding past the thick filaments and ultimately disappear during maximum muscle contraction. Remember, the I band is made up of the thin filaments and Z discs, and the H zone consists of the M line protein myomycin, shown by this chain, and the thick filaments. Even though these two sarcomere regions disappear, the lengths of the thin and thick filaments and the overall width of the A band, shown in pink, stay relatively the same. The sarcomere shortens because the Z discs found on either side of the sarcomere that the thin filaments are attached to are pulled closer together. This results in a compounding effect. As the sarcomeres shorten, the muscle fiber shortens, which leads to the entire muscle shortening. The muscle contraction cycle is a repeating series of events that allows the filaments to slide past each other, resulting in muscle contraction. When muscle contraction is triggered, calcium ions stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum or SR in the muscle fiber, are released into the sarcoplasm. The calcium ions bond to the regulatory protein troponin located on the thin filaments. Then troponin's shape changes, which causes tropomyosin, the other regulatory protein, to swivel away and expose the myosin binding sites on the actin. Now the four-step contraction cycle begins, and it's as easy to remember as A, B, C, and D. The first step, step A, is ATP hydrolysis. On the myosin head, there is an ATP binding site and an enzyme called ATPase. Remember that enzymes often end in the suffix ASE. Now this enzyme ATPase hydrolyzes or breaks down ATP, its substrate, into ADP and a phosphate group. Both of these products remain attached to the myosin head after the reaction. Now the myosin head is activated. It's at a higher energy state and is repositioned so it's in a better position to attach to the actin. Step B is binding. The myosin heads now attach to the myosin binding sites on actin, shown by these black dots, similar to the way a peg fits into a hole. And the bonds that form are called cross bridges. This binding releases the phosphate group from the myosin head while ADP is still attached for the moment. Step C is contraction with the cross bridges. Now the power stroke occurs. The heads bend and rotate, releasing ADP. And as they bend, the cross bridges produce force as the heads rotate toward the center of the sarcomere. Think of this movement as being similar to the motion of oars rowing a boat but not all of the heads are moving at the same time in a synchronized fashion. This movement causes the thin filaments 
to slide past the thick filaments as they move toward the M line. The last step, D, is detachment. And this last step involves detachment of the myosin heads from actin. After the power stroke, a new molecule of ATP binds to the myosin head, which breaks the cross bridge and detaches myosin from actin. This cycle will repeat as long as there is enough ATP and calcium ions to supply it. The rate of speed is pretty extreme, with each cross bridge able to attach and detach five times per second. The combined effect of the thin filaments sliding past the thick filaments pulls on the Z-discs, which then pull on the adjacent sarcomeres on either side, which shortens the entire muscle fiber. Then, as the muscle fibers shorten, they pull on their surrounding connective tissue layers. The endomysium, the perimysium, and the epimysium, and the tendons, which generates tension that pulls on the bones they are attached to. Muscle contraction begins when the concentration of calcium ions in the sarcoplasm increases and ends when the calcium concentration decreases. Relaxed muscle fibers have a very low concentration of calcium ions in their sarcoplasm, with most of it stored and isolated inside the SR. In excitation-contraction coupling, the muscle action potential moves across the sarcolemma and down the T-tubules. This is called propagation and is the excitation part. The calcium ion release channels in the SR membrane open, allowing calcium ions to flood into the sarcoplasm. This increases the concentration of calcium by a factor of 10. Calcium ions now bind to troponin, changing its shape, which swings tropomyosin away from actin to reveal the binding sites. The contraction cycle can now begin. Myosin heads can attach to the binding sites and form cross bridges. This is the contraction part. Calcium ions are also pumped back into the SR through calcium ion active transport pumps, shown here in blue. This is an active transport process that requires ATP to pump calcium ions against their concentration gradient in an uphill manner from low to high concentration. The calcium ion release channels, shown in black, close once the last muscle action potential has moved through the T-tubules. Calcium ions are pumped back into the SR and the calcium ion concentration in the sarcoplasm begins to decrease. As calcium ions move into the SR, a calcium binding protein called calciquestrin attaches to calcium ions, encouraging more of the ions to be stored or sequestered inside the SR. Now the calcium ion concentration in the SR is 10,000 times higher than the sarcoplasm of a relaxed muscle fiber. As the calcium ion concentration decreases, tropomyosin swivels back around actin, blocking the myosin binding sites, causing the muscle fiber to relax. Sarcomere length is another very important factor that influences muscle contraction. The force of muscle contraction is dependent on the sarcomere length before the beginning of the contraction cycle. This graph plots the resting sarcomere length, which is shown as a percentage of the optimum length, against the amount of tension developed, which is shown as a percent of the maximum tension from 0 to 100 percent. When the resting sarcomere length is between 80 and 120 percent of resting length, muscle tension will be at its highest, shown by the peak in the graph. This is because there is optimal overlap 
between the thin filaments shown in gray and the thick filaments shown in red inside the sarcomere. This length is approximately between 2 to 2.4 microns, which is close to the normal sarcomere resting length. When a muscle fiber is contracted excessively or understretched, such as when you're lifting too heavy a weight, the sarcomeres become much shorter than the optimum, a length of around 1.8 microns, and the tension quickly decreases. The thick filaments become crowded and pushed in by the Z-discs, and their shape is deformed, which prevents the myosin heads from forming cross bridges with the thin filaments, which also tend to overlap each other. When the sarcomeres are overstretched far beyond their resting length, the thin filaments are pulled too far away from the myosin heads at a sarcomere length of 3.8 microns, preventing them from making contact with the myosin binding sites. As the sarcomeres are overstretched, muscle tension decreases. When 170% of the sarcomere's length is reached, there is no overlap whatsoever between the thin and thick filaments. Tension now quickly decreases to zero, and muscle contraction cannot take place.